from Dr. Stunts. We're here with Dr. Stunts with the Heart Institute, uh, Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and uh, tell us a little bit about your program. Well, we run the Center for Sport Fish Science and Conservation, what we call the Sport Fish Center, and it's a research program at A&M Corpus Christi at the Heart Research Institute, Institute that's dedicated to doing sport fish research from trout, redfish, flounder, red snapper, sharks, we kind of cover the whole sport fish scene. So have you seen um, have you seen some interest in your program and some positive results as of what you're doing? Yeah, one of the key programs we run is called Release Sense. It's sort of a play on word, release makes sense. And the whole idea there is that we certainly uh, want people to enjoy a nice meal and, and experience the fish that they catch, but also to be wise stewards of the resource. And so the idea is that you can catch these fish and release them and they're a renewable resource. And so what we try to do is teach anglers how to do it properly. So if you choose to release your fish, how can you do it so you know that it's going to uh, survive? So two scientists, we got three scientists on board? Three scientists on board. And so. uh, we're here in Port Mansfield. We're gonna go out and we're going to uh, try to, he's gonna actually show me and teach me proper release techniques that, that, that I can um, extend to my clients that I fish with and so that we can um, practice safe uh, fish releases and that's really we're doing it anyway but I want somebody to, that knows the know and has the data and the background to back it up to show me how to do it that's yeah. really what I'm hoping that's right and, and there's a few tricks yeah and by the way that's Dr. Matt Strike and Quentin Hall who are uh, some key scientists with my group working on a variety of sport fish but yeah if, if you use some certain and little techniques you can really improve the survivorship right. that's one thing that I hear a lot of that if you catch a trout that it's dead just go ahead and throw it in the cooler but after meeting Dr. Greg Stunts uh, maybe six months ago I learned the percentages were a lot higher than that yeah so I'm yeah impressed. and so we see uh, upwards of 90 percent in fact you know we, we we are very surprised to see that high number and so they do very well if they're handled properly uh, many times to, to know that you know we've held them in cages was how we did the initial studies but then the second phase of the study, we put electronic tran little transmitters inside them. So you might imagine we're catching a fish, bringing it back to the boat, doing surgery, cutting it, putting a tag in, stitching it back up, and then releasing it. And we're still seeing that upwards of 90% survival. So, you know, releasing it on the spot after a quick picture, you know, is e even better. So we see that high rate with uh, flounder, red, even red snapper, which is a whole other story, but especially spotted sea trout. And even tournament anglers, you know, we were concerned about tournaments, you know, being caught and they're in a live well all day and then go to weigh in. We do see higher mortality there, but it's still up, upwards of 70% survival. So, you know, it's, it's catch and release works is what it really comes down to. Yeah. Our, our key thing in terms of what really determines mortality is hook placement, believe it or not. Uh, angler skill level is a big difference makes a big difference and, and what I mean by that is if the fish has swallowed the hook and usually beginner anglers have a difficult time of detecting the, the bite and so they oftentimes get a deeper hook fish that that's not good if a spotted sea trout has swallowed the hook it, those are the ones you want to keep there that's pretty much a death sentence about nearly 99 almost 100 percent in many cases in different trials of fish that has swallowed the hook and that's whether you clip clip it off at the you know where you tie it onto the lure and leave it in the fish, or whether you pull it out, we tried everything, but yeah, they, they seem to live for a short period of time, but within 24 hours, they didn't make it. Yeah. The other uh, area where that caused a lot of mortality was uh, if their gills were torn, and not necessarily bleeding, or if you puncture a gill, that's not a bad thing, but if you torn one, but that was pretty rare. And interestingly enough, when we looked at the thousands of trout that we caught here in this study, about 10% of those are deep hooked, you know, you have about a 10% mortality, which pretty much explains uh, where that's coming from. But hooked in the eye, deep in the mouth, externally, none of that. That they were they were just fine. Uh, as I mentioned, angler skill level was the only really other effect we really saw. But we looked at treble hooks, we looked at single hooks, we looked at live baits, dead baits. You know, you name it, we we looked at it, and uh, it, it really came down to hook location was what explain most of that. Well, that's awesome. So we're going to go fishing today. We're going to release a few fish. I think we're going to try to tag a few fish. Um, hopefully we're going to tag some special fish if we're real lucky and uh, just have a good day of fishing out on the bay today with uh, Dr. Greg and his team uh, down here in Port Mansfield, Texas. We're, we're excited. We're looking forward to a good day on the water. Yep. So looking forward
forward to it. Be Get fun. ready, Jimmy. We're gonna have to take off, my man. I'm here with Dr. Greg Stunts out of uh, the Heart Institute, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and I've just hooked a redfish. And uh, Dr. Greg is going to explain to us the best uh, handling and release tactics that we're going to use out here. Obviously, a, a lipping tool really helps, so you minimize handling the fish. Oftentimes, especially on spotted sea trout, uh, you can damage their slime layer. And the slime layer is uh, for their immunity. It helps them uh, protect from getting infections and that sort of thing. And so you want to minimize handling the fish. Once you give it a few minutes to aerate, especially redfish in a little warmer water, um, he's ready to release. <laughs> so you can tell he's ready and, and lively, and that's what you want to see. So once you take it out, you can kind of hold their tail a little bit and get them going. Oh, oh darn, I didn't want him to swim off so bad. Healthy <laughs> release, no Healthy less. release. I was going to get, he was ready to go. We'll, we'll get another one on that. Oh, there we go. That was good. Were you rolling on that one? So yeah, a good practice is right, even when you've hooked them, of course they've expended a lot of energy and need an oxygen. If you want to release them, you know, let them recover just for a minute. We like to use single hooks. So, um, with trout, how, how much do they really depend on scent when they're feeding? Well, all fish, you know, most fish, you know, they have all the normal senses we would, you know, uh, but they're a little bit different. So, of course, they've got sight and they've got hearing, although they hear a little bit different. Um, they have otoliths and in, uh, inner ear similar to the structure of humans, so they're very good at detecting vibrations. So then, of course, Golly, that was all over my bait over there. But I don't know if that was a shadow from the bird, too. I think that was part shadow, but anyway. So, uh, different species of fish rely on smell much more. So, for example, drum, redfish, um, but fish can definitely smell. They're very good at, at detecting scent in the water. I mean, the ultimate, of course, is a shark, you know. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of refined sense of smell. But what's interesting, fish also have a uh, sixth sense, we call it, and that's their lateral line. So it's a series of specialized cells that run down their body. Snook, of course, have probably the most pronounced lateral line of any species, but, but uh, all of them have it. And it's very specialized cell that, cells that can detect very, very weak vibrations in the water. They can locate and orient towards their prey. So they can feed in complete murk or complete darkness if they can, you know, detect the movement of a bait. So, so you know, we like to say you want to you want to use lures that are appealing to as many senses as possible, and that's why you know baits that vibrate a lot or have some type of water movement are real effective because they can really hone in on those. And that was another thing I was going to ask is how sensitive they can feel vibration. Very good. <laughs> Very sensitive. And um, so like fishing in complete darkness, middle of the night, with something with a lot of vibration can be effective. They, they can, can still- 180 and grab the bait without seeing it. Wow. Yeah, so uh, they know, so uh, 
is that vibrations are coming through the water. They hit the fish's body along that lateral line at different orientations and slightly different times, you know, as the speed of sound is moving across their body, those vibrations are moving at the speed of sound. And they can use that to orient where that bait is. So they don't need uh, visibility. In fact, we prefer to fish kind of murky water because they can find your bait and they seem to want to eat artificial lures a little bit better in the murky, the clear stuff they can kind of, I think it's they can detect there's something wrong or it's not quite real. And also they tend to feed, some studies we've done with other species of fish, they tend to feed better when the water's just a little bit murky. Oh god dang it. Oh my goodness, one? I missed it. Damn. I was on you though, so <laughs> got the hook set. That, that was, was aggressive. He's going to be oversized, I think. So he'd be one you want to really kind of revive a little. Especially if these were trout. The redfish tend to be pretty hardy. Hold them up. He's probably about 24. He's Nothing huge, but a good one. Just let him go and let him tell you when he's ready. So a trout that size, we would revive just a little bit more. They're little. So one thing I've wondered that, you know, I've heard people say yes and no. Do fish feel pain? Yeah, they do, but very different than, than the way, uh, the pain we experience. Um, so, uh, they have a completely different uh, series of their nervous system. So they can experience sensations, and, and, uh, but it's a very different than mammals experience pain. I've always figured they do because I've realized, you know, even trying to land a fish, just touching it, they feel that. They freak out. Yeah, and, uh, you know, unhooking one that might be hooked, you know, deeper or something, you, know, you can tell that they... Uh, oh, yeah, uh, especially with topwaters. It's a very uh, different neural network than what we have as humans. So it's not near as refined or sensory, but... That's interesting. But once they're hooked, they don't, you know, I mean, obviously they generally head the opposite direction once hooked, you know, once the hook's in, it's, the pain's kind of over. Um, so yeah. how exactly, I, you know, of course I've noticed and a lot of people know during high pressure systems, fish are a little more or less active. Yeah. So how exactly does the pressure affect the fish? Why does it make them not want to well, feed as actively? It, it depends on the species of fish again too. Some are more sensitive than others. But pressure um, definitely affects the, the fish bite. With high pressure, or you know, uh, typically a, a rising barometer is not as good as a falling barometer. Mm -hmm. Although right as the front hits and it begins to rise can be real good. But once it high pressure really sets in, so fish like a, a drum have an advanced swim bladder. It's a bladder they can inflate or deflate with air. Well, all bony fish have, have them and they're, they have really good sensory mechanisms to detect pressure. And for whatever reason, um, high pressure can just really uh, uh, cause fish to uh, quit biting. And, or maybe they go out deeper, or they're you know, a much more difficult bite, but typically uh, low pressure is associated with storms and fronts, and the fish know some weather pattern is happening, and so they really go into a, a feeding frenzy. So, we really pay a lot of attention to the pressure, especially uh, uh, during the winter time. After those, the days that you want to be out fishing and nice and clear and calm, uh, those high pressure days aren't so, so good for catching. So you kind of covered another question I was gonna ask, kind of a branch off of <clears throat> the pressure thing. So when a cold front's coming through and it's bringing high pressure, do you think these fish are sensing that and they know that that's coming and they think, okay, I need to feed before yeah. this pressure hits? Maybe a few days before, you know, because the water then gets really stirred up and things. So 
they know that triggers them to feed it. It also happens a lot in isolated around thunderstorms and small pockets of low pressure. And that's why it seems to be always, why fishermen get in trouble a lot because the fishing gets really good right ahead of fronts and storms. And then they tend to shut down. Although for a while, even as the front's hitting or shortly after the front, it still can be really, really good. But then once that high pressure really settles in, I like when it, if it's above 30, you're starting to see the bite diminish and 30.3, is when I, it's very difficult to get trout a trout bite. Redfish don't seem to be as bothered. And of course, offshore deep water fish, they're deep enough that the atmospheric pressure doesn't, doesn't affect them that much. So trout and red, oh, there's one on mine right now. They were gonna get. Boy, he's all around the thing. So another big one. Um, can fish see color and to what what uh, extent for sure so in our eye, eyes we have two different types of cells rods and cones and ones for uh, low light and you know uh, night vision or day vision you know kind of thing mm -hmm. and then um, the uh, others are for color vision and so they have a very well developed eye they can they can definitely see color There it is. Well, I stopped to put my mask up. <laughs> Okay, we're tagging flounder. We're going to do a little experiment here with uh, teaching me how to tag fish. Gulf flounder have three dots. Gulf flounder has three dots. Three distinct dots. Like well, these kind of have some like dots, box. but they're very distinct and, and in a triangular shape. And those fin rays right there, will, it'll go a little bit further up. That's a nice fish. Yeah. All right. So first, we got to record a tag number. Well, just remember, remember, remember this: zero zero five six. Zero zero five six. Yep. Okay, right. are we in? All right, go ahead, Matt. Yep, tag us in. We're gonna get our fish up here. And then uh, you're yeah, just gonna go measure poke it in at an angle right about there. Turn it so the tag is towards the body like that. Go for it, you do All it. Right. And then we're gonna go in. We wanna make sure we get through halfway. And then pull that back in right there. That's it. And it should be on those. We wanna get right a there. measurement. You yeah. wanna hand me my rod. So that means it should be passed. It's kinda harder on a flounder because it's thin, but. And before we let him go, we want to get a measure. So it's a southern flounder, and uh, there's a stick right there. Oh, right. We so, got a southern flounder, and we know it's a female, but generally males don't get this big. All right. and they don't really get much of. So he's 18 inches even. So. Okay. 
18 right, inches. That's even. a nice one. And then we'll just give them a little walk right there. Great, I dropped four. Nice and tiny. There he goes. Good job. Good All right, guys. Um, I'm here with, uh, again, with, we're finishing out a day with Dr. Greg Stunts and his team here. Um, Quentin and uh, Matthew, we came down to do some fishing. We were going to do some tagging. They taught me how to safely release fish and keep them in the water. A lot of, a lot of cool techniques. I was able to uh, tag a flounder. Well, actually, Matthew helped me, but, but I was able to tag a flounder. So if anybody catches it out there, please report it. I want to see where it ends up. Um, but uh, thanks for coming down, Greg. What'd you think yeah, about today? That, this was a great trip. It was a lot of fun. We caught a lot of redfish and uh, several trout mixed in. And so, you know, the important thing here, I think, is that, you know, showing that this catch and release really works. I mean, we certainly, with release sense and our program, don't mind keeping a few fish for dinner. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, you want to enjoy that experience of fishing and having a nice meal. But at the same time, we want to be wise conservationists and stewards of the resource. And so if you release these fish, uh, anglers can be confident they survive very well. About 90% of the trout and even better for trout, even better for redfish and flounder uh, do really well with catch and release. So it's just a wise conservation tool that we encourage everyone to practice. Yeah, so, so coupled with uh, release sense and the empty stringers pr catch and release program that Captain Ernest and I are doing, we've, we've developed a good relationship and partnership along with some other CCA, Shimano and Yamaha Motors is just to name a few that yep. all kind of collectively have, is co have come together to help us uh, preserve and have a sustainable fishery uh, down here up and down the Texas coast and wherever really. So uh, we're going to continue down this trail and uh, path and hope that it pays off and pays dividends in the future. We, we're, we feel that it will. Yeah. Well, so. yeah, and we're really happy about that. You know, obviously we're avid anglers, but we like to bring the science to the table. So when anglers ask, hey, how can I make sure my fish survive or what can I do to ensure maximum success? We have the science that backs that up and it clearly shows that catch and release is what we need to be doing. All right, well, good. Well, stay tuned, and um, hopefully we'll all be together again soon, catching fish and tagging them and uh, continuing down this path. Thanks a lot.